This will be the last lecture on anti-predator adaptations and uh, previously we talked about how to avoid being detected by predators or um, how to dissuade a, an attack. But now what we want to move on to is if those two things fail, how do you prevent from actually being captured? And if you are captured, um, how do you prevent uh, the predator from eating you uh, in the end? Okay, let's first talk about preventing capture. Go back to an example we talked about earlier in the semester when we were talking about the underwing moths. Um, they have a cryptic uh, forewing, which blends in well with uh, their background, so their first defense is uh, basically preventing detection. But if that fails, they can quickly open up um, the forewings and expose the hind wings, which have these um, bright contrasting colored eye spots and the idea here is that this will startle a potential attacker giving them time to escape. This was tested with blue jays um, that were trained to get food from artificial moths that were basically made out of uh, paper mache and the moths had seeds in the thorax so the birds were trained to uh, locate these as, as a food source uh, during a training period and then um, the models were made where the gray hind wings um, would be exposed when handled by the birds and then they would record what the birds response was and basically what the study showed was that the birds were more likely to drop the prey when the hind wings were painted with bright colors that suddenly startled them or if they had eye spots uh, and that the birds indicated that it was some kind of shock, shock that they received uh, because they would give an alarm call um, when they uh, jumped back One of the other things you can do to make a capture less likely to be successful is direct the attack to the posterior part of your body so that you can then um, go forward and, and escape. Some animals have posterior false heads um, because predators oftentimes attack the heads for a, qu a quick kill. And he, this is seen in some caterpillars. Uh, we showed a, a, a caterpillar in the previous lecture that was mimicking a vine snake and if you look at that in that looked like a head that was actually the posterior of the caterpillar. Here we have a, a photograph of a hair streak butterfly. Hair streak butterflies, again the posterior end has these um, antenna like uh, projections coming off of the back of the wing with an eye spot that even has some radiating um, lines going from this false head. The figure uh, here shows the result of a study in which they took um, butterflies that don't have uh, this type of uh, false head but if they uh, artificially put that on there and then they look at how often time uh, jays will attack the wrong end of these butterflies and the prey uh, escape you can see that when the false heads are painted on with these uh, radiating stripes going from the head um, there was a, a much higher fraction of them escaping the, the jay attacks than the controls here and in this case they really needed two controls this is just the unmanipulated group but they should have also had a group um, that had um, the same type of just white paint or whatever the background color of the butterflies was painted on it as well as an experimental control and they, they failed to do that in this study which was uh, unfortunate another way to uh, direct the attack to the posterior part of your body is seen in some lizards uh, skinks for example around here the young individuals have these uh, bright blue tails oftentimes that will draw the attention of a potential predator and they'll uh, strike that area then the, the tail will detach and, and wiggle to continue to draw the attention of the predator while the uh, prey species leaves. Another way of preventing uh, capture is to spray predators with chemicals. The picture on the bottom here is showing a caterpillar that has this aversible structure that can spray a nasty chemical if it's um, attacked. Unfortunately, this isn't a color photograph. Uh, I've seen color photographs of this before, and it's a bright reddish-orange organism, which, again, that, that would make it a good example of aposematic coloration. The snake on the right is actually an individual that was hit by the chemical that was sprayed from this caterpillar, and you can see that it was it's this glue-like adhesive structure that actually glued the snake together where it couldn't move. 
Walking sticks uh, have a chemical defense where they will spray um, this kind of uh, freon smelling chemical to uh, any bird or potential predator that picks them up as a deterrent. Millipedes, many of you have held millipedes before and if you uh, uh, smell your hands after you've held a millipede, they smell horrible. Millipedes also have this chemical defense to prevent uh, predators from, from eating them. Now I want to move on to uh, some of the benefits that can accrue to uh, social species that live in groups. Living in groups can potentially have costs associated with it. Um, if you're living in a group, um, you're, you're definitely not going to be cryptic. You're actually making yourself more visible, so it may make it easier for a predator to, to detect you. Um, outside of the predator-prey relationship, though, there's just going to be more competition for food and mates with the individuals of your species in your group. And dense aggravation, aggregations of, of individuals can increase the, the uh, chance and uh, frequency of spread of diseases. Well, some species do live in groups, and uh, these are the species that can uh, have benefits that, that can overcome the potential cost that I mentioned previously. Uh, w where it comes to related to predators, um, individuals in groups are foraging and looking up for predators at uh, different times and looking in different directions, so there are more eyes looking out for predators, so that each individual has less scanning uh, time, which means that individuals in bigger groups should be able to spend more of their time budget um, foraging. And this figure here is kind of demonstrating another thing. In groups, individuals are oftentimes facing in different directions, and yeah, every, individuals are, are looking up and feeding at different time periods, and studies have indicated that this is a totally random process. Uh, because if it was coordinated where everybody, you know, took turns foraging at different times, um, predator could pick up on that pattern and take advantage of it. But if it's a, a completely random process, a predator won't have that capability. Um, and you can see in the background the zebras are facing in different direction and looking in some cases in different directions. Um, and obviously that's something that a single individual wouldn't be able to do, look at all directions at once. Well, one of the predictions of living in groups is that the scan rate per individual will decrease as the size of the group increases. And this is supported by lots of studies of, of birds uh, and mammals. Uh, here's a, a, some results from a study on starlings. Let's look at each row in, in turn. Um, if you look at the mean number of times per minute that a bird stops foraging to look up, you see that when birds are foraging solitarily, just one bird, it's uh, 23.4 uh, times a minute versus in a cage of 10 individuals, um, it's less than half that at 11.4 times per minute. Uh, that means the percentage of foraging time spent in surveillance uh, is much higher when you're uh, foraging solitarily than in a group of, of uh, 10 individuals. And even while you are for foraging more and spending less time in surveillance, the effect of the effectiveness of the surveillance is increased when you're in a group. So if you look at the mean takeoff time in seconds after a hawk uh, model was flown over uh, these groups, you see that the solitary starlings on average have a much slower response than the caged individuals that were uh, in groups of 10, uh, which means you're probably detecting the, the hawk at a, a greater distance and uh, giving yourself more time to potentially uh, escape. So as group size increases, uh, just to kind of continue with that last point, you see a faster reaction time to the predator. And so here's kind of continuing uh, that study with even larger flocks, showing that going from one to greater than 50 individuals in a flock, there's a nice linear increase in the mean reaction time as far as the distance the hawk gets to you before it, it's seen. So in a big flock, you know, um, the hawk is, is seen at a much greater distance away, and it basically gets right up on top of you uh, in many cases when you're a solitary individual. 
this uh, translates into different success rates from the predator's point of view. Uh, a predator is much more likely to uh, successfully attack uh, a pigeon in a uh, small group or solitary uh, individual, and, but as the flock size increases, the chance of success from the predator's point of view uh, is increasingly less and less likely. Now there are a couple of terms associated with benefits of uh, anti-predator benefits of being in a group. One, you'll hear people refer to this as a selfish herd. And this points to the fact that individuals are not joining groups for the good of the group, they're doing it because it benefits themselves. Individuals join groups for their own selfish reasons. They want to decrease their own predation risk. It just so happens that joining groups also benefits other group members as well. But what drives it is the selection at the individual level. Another term oftentimes referred to this, this topic is the dilution effect. Uh, which refers to the fact that there is safety in numbers and the larger the number the greater your individual safety. So in this example of butterflies feeding at a mud puddle uh, to get the nutrients associated with this mud, uh, the bigger the group of butterflies the lower the individual risk of predation. So we talked about big groups the predator is less likely to be successful but, but even if the predator does kill someone your individual chance of being the individual killed is going to be reduced. So here we see the predation risk probability of capture for any individual uh, goes down drastically from solitary to about 10 and then it kind of there's still some benefits of larger and larger groups but it uh, is reduced. The, the, the rate at which uh, the benefit increases is reduced. Well, synchronization is going to be a really key point uh, in making uh, the dilution effect work. Uh, here, here we see some examples of penguins that are uh, about to enter water to go forage, and one of the things they can do is, is go into the water in mass to avoid uh, this, the chance of being picked off by a leopard seal, because uh, the seals can only capture one individual at a time, and again, if you jump in with a, a group of 100, um, your probability of being the individual attacked is about 1%. Again, pointing out to the fact that synchronization is the key to making the dilution effect work. We talked about that uh, previous example of mobbing and colonial bee eaters. As long as everybody is still at the colony breeding at the same time, there are a lot of potential individuals in the area to mob a, a snake predator as it approaches the colony. But late nesting individuals, uh, if they're the only individuals at the colony, everybody else has left the colony, um, they're not going to benefit uh, from mobbing. They're going to have to deal with these predators on their own. This figure here is talking about um, the same pattern of, of the effect of synchronization uh, to the dilution effect and, and benefits of, of being in a group related to predation in mayflies. Uh, mayflies have very short life spans and so they tend to emerge uh, very synchronously uh, on the same set of days and uh, that's for breeding efficiency but also it reduces their predation rate. So you can see uh, as the number of mayflies emerging per day increases the total predation rate uh, decreases. So synchronization is important not only for mating efficiency but to reduce predation rate. Now, the dilution effect talks about how individual chances of survival um, increase as you get in bigger and bigger groups, but I don't want to give the impression, and the selfish herd talks about how individuals are going to join herds for their own selfish reasons, but the benefits that accrue to different individuals uh, may be different. Uh, all positions may not be equal and have the same benefits. So here there's some data on bluegills uh, nesting in relationship, uh, their success in relationship to nest position. And the center of a bluegill colony is, is safer. Uh, dominant individuals are the ones that get these safest locations and subordinates basically are pushed to the edge of the colony. But these subordinates are still going to be better off being near the colony than they will be um, on their own uh, typically. 
uh, at least from the perspective of predation. So let's look at the data uh, in this figure. So if we look at the center of the colony, if you look at the number of snail predators, uh, relatively low compared to the edge of the colony, and being away from the colony entirely has the highest number of snail predators. If you look at the mean number of chases of uh, egg predators per hour, in this case it's other fish that are the, the predators, again, the, the center of the colony, there are fewer chases per hour, and if you're nesting solitarily, you're spending a lot of your time chasing away other fish predators. Now, the reason why the, the center colony uh, has a uh, fewer number of chases is because there are more individuals around you protecting their nest, running off predators, and your nest benefits from that as well. In fact, if you look at the percentage of predator chases that involve two bluegills in the denser aggregations of, of nests in the center of the colony, um, about 50% of the chases involve um, uh, two or more uh, bluegills. The edge of the colony, sometimes pairs will work together to, to chase off individuals from their collective kind of nearby nests. But if you're away from the colony, there just aren't any neighbors near you, and so you're, you're stuck doing this on your own. And so the predation rates of the uh, individual nest uh, vary drastically from the center of the colony to away from the colony. Okay, another thing you can do to prevent capture is produce an alarm call. Now, there's some potential that alarm calls could uh, cost signalers if it draws the attention of the predator and it makes it more likely that the predator will uh, attack you. Uh, but remember we talked about the evolution of alarm calls that uh, use high frequencies that reduce the potential for a predator to be able to locate where that call is coming from, and so this may minimize that cost. And in some cases, really, that might be a benefit. If you let the predator know you, that you see them, so the alarm call not only is communicating the potential of a predator uh, to attack members in a group near you, but it's also letting the predator say, no, hey, I know you're there. I know where you are. If you're going to attack anybody, ta attack them, not me, because I have the best chance of escape because uh, I, I kind of had this, this early warning. Um, but the alarm call just in general is going to coordinate uh, a potential group escape and which could benefit all individuals. Um, coordinated escape will make it more difficult for the predator to focus in on any one individual and attack them. Um, so it, it could be, there may be low cost or no cost to you, maybe even a benefit to you um, by uh, eliciting this call. And some species give very predator-specific alarm calls uh, to, to make this coordinated uh, evasive action more efficient. So uh, colobus monkeys pictured here and vervet monkeys um, are two examples that have very specific alarm calls. One call is a snake call that for a terrestrial snake that says, you know, climb a tree to, to safety. Um, a hawk call basically says get out of the trees, go into the dense uh, bushes because you know, there's an aerial attack coming. And so. Um, the specific alarm call tells exactly what kind of evasive maneuver is needed. And finally, one of the benefits that an alarm call might do is, is by this coordinated escape of the group, um, some individuals of the group may be close relatives, and in that case, um, you are saving copies of your genes that happen to be in other individuals, and so you're helping pass those on to uh, the next generation. Um, in a greater number than they would have if they would have been attacked by a predator. Okay, the last thing we want to talk about in this topic is let's say that you have been attacked successfully, the predators got you, is there anything you can do to prevent them from actually eating you, uh, killing you and eating you? One of the things you can do is, is signal your impending death by screaming, um, doing this auditorily or in some cases animals will release chemicals which are basically a chemical version of a scream. What could be the benefit of this? Well it might startle the predator. Uh, they may loosen their grip so that you can uh, escape. And there's some indication that it may serve to attract other predators. 
And the idea here is that if you attract multiple predators, they'll start fighting among themselves on who's going to eat you, and that might give you a chance to escape. And here are some examples of uh, some of these um, screams uh, in, in two different uh, taxa and what they kind of converged on as far as sound. So this is a rabbit scream. This is what some rabbits sound like when they're um, in your grasp. And this is a bullfrog release call. This is a song, a, a, a scream that bullfrogs will uh, do if you pick them up. That amazing sound was the sound a bullfrog makes when it's being swallowed alive by a water snake. Scientists think they make this call to attract predators, such as foxes or birds, that may attack the snake, allowing the bullfrog to go free. And while this may sound kind of like a wild idea, um, there is some anecdotal evidence that this might work. One of the things that people do that hunt coyotes will play these rabbit screams to attract coyotes uh, to the area. And here is a study that basically demonstrated the potential for this screaming um, idea to, to work as a last ditch uh, attempt to escape predation. Fathead minnows will do a chemical version of the alarm call um, when they're uh, captured by pike. And um, if you look at the handling time, when two pike are present versus, and they're battling over who gets to eat uh, the fathead minnow versus just one pike only, the handling time significantly increases, and uh, five of the 13 trials, um, the minnows uh, were able to escape uh, successfully uh, in, in the cases where two pike were present. So in review, there are things you can do to prevent capture if a predator uh, does uh, attempt to uh, attack. One thing you can do is startle the predator and kind of uh, slow down that attack. You could redirect the attack to the posterior part of your body by using a false head or some uh, colorful moving uh, tail appendage. You can uh, spray chemicals in the face of the predator uh, to, to stop them. We talked about various group benefits uh, related to anti-predation behavior. Uh, groups can more efficiently uh, detect uh, the uh, predator attack, so they'll be seen sooner uh, and uh, less time per individual is needed to actually uh, spend uh, scanning so you can spend more time foraging. If the predator does attack and successfully kill someone, your chance of being the individual killed is, is diluted, um, and that's with increasing group size, and that's called the dilution effect. And we talk about the importance of synchronization, of keeping everybody together in groups um, to reduce the uh, chance that a predator will be successful. One of the things I should have mentioned with regard to that is synchronization. Think about flocks of birds or schools of fish uh, swimming in coordinated patterns. Um, that also reduces the potential that the predator will be able to successfully focus on a single individual uh, and kill it. And so that, uh, again, kind of uh, is one benefit of synchronization. Now, groups uh, do benefit individuals, but maybe not all the benef benefits are spread evenly between all individuals. So we gave the example of the bluegills, where interior individuals nesting have higher reproductive success than those on the edge, but at least those on the edge are doing better than they would uh, on their own. The last thing to do to prevent capture is produce alarm calls that communicate potentially the unprofitability, uh, your unprofitability to the predator. You know, I've seen you, don't attack me. It can help coordinate the escape. Um, again, kind of like we were talking about the synchronization, uh, makes it di more difficult for the predator to, to focus in on one individual. And if the group is composed of related individuals, if you decrease the chance that the predator is successful, um, you're passing on more copies of your genes by your own survival, but the survival of close relatives. And finally, uh, if you are captured, the things that you can do to prevent consumption include screaming, which may startle the predator so you can escape, or attract competing 
predator so that they can fight over you, again, allowing you to potentially escape.